Obama. We're in the great city of London for the World Nuclear Symposium 2023. And one of the mandates of the World Nuclear Association is to educate and inform stakeholders of the benefits of nuclear energy. And one of the ways you do that is through this conference. So maybe you can just give us a rundown on how this conference compares to previous conferences in terms of the attendance. In terms of the attendance, I believe this is one of the largest that we have ever had. So we are uh, about 700 people here today at the World Nuclear uh, Symposium 2023. And uh, last year, I think we were about uh, 570, which is also pretty good, but clearly this year is fabulous. So very excited about having so many colleagues here today with us at the World Nuclear Symposium. So last year, 550, this year, 700. Mm -hmm. Where is the interest coming from? Are these producers, utilities, investors? Everywhere, everywhere. So we are seeing unprecedented interest in anything and everything related to nuclear. So we see policymakers in many, many countries uh, all over the world, North America, South America, Europe, uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa. All these countries are very interested in nuclear. So this means that we have much more interest also from industry, also from regulators, also for the finance community, which I know is one of the people that you talk to. People are wondering, where is, how is, where is this nuclear thing? Tell me more. So this is what we are doing here, trying to, to, to clarify and to explain how nuclear energy is, first of all, an essential uh, energy for, for decarbonization, for energy security, and also for equity, right? Making sure that everybody everywhere has access to abundant, affordable 24 seven energy. And in addition to conferences, another method that the WNA uses to educate and inform mm -hmm. the public is through publications. You mm -hmm. released one today, the nuclear fuel report. Maybe you can just tell us about that I report. I will tell you about that, yes. Yeah. So the fuel report is one of our flagship publications. We publish this every two years. And essentially we gather the wisdom and the, the, the analysis of the industry in everything related to the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle. So whether uranium projects, uh, whether it's milling, whether it is conversion, enrichment, fuel fabrication. And what we do is we actually have three scenarios. These are projection scenarios. Basically, we take the information that is available to us and, and we make like an average scenario, an optimistic scenario, and one that is maybe not so optimistic. And then based on those projections, we try to say what are the needs for the global nuclear industry and how we are going to meet them. So this is what we released today, the, war, uh, the, the nuclear fuel report. And if someone wants to acquire the nuclear fuel report or any of your other reports, where can they go to find this information? Visit our website. Yeah, so I will tell you, besides the report, so we have the, fuel, the nuclear fuel report that was released today about two weeks ago we released the World Nuclear Supply Chain Report that actually focuses on the entire, on the, on the rest of the nuclear fuel cycle, the supply chain. So looking at uh, nuclear projects as in uh, nuclear power plants, but also the entire, the entire uh, center and back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. We also released also maybe two or, two or three weeks ago, the World Nuclear Performance Report that summarizes uh, how the global nuclear fleet is performing, and also uh, gives us how we are doing as far as construction projects, what, it's, what is the progress. But the thing that I wanted to tell you that maybe your, your audience is interested, one of the things that we do have in our website that we are incredibly proud of is our uh, information library. We have the most comprehensive and up-to-date uh, database about anything and everything in nuclear. So if your audience wants to learn a little bit more about nuclear energy, about the fuel cycle, about which countries are doing what in this space, they need to come to our website. I spent a lot of time on your website and there's a wealth of information yes. in there. Thank you for, for, for saying so, yes. Sama, you've been coming to this conference for many years now. You have been the Director General of the WNA since 2020. Have you ever seen a more positive environment for nuclear energy than now? No, I, I don't think I have. I mean, so the, because right now we really are in a, in a point in time that, first of all, yes, decarbonization, climate change, everybody's aware that nuclear can be a key essential contributor to that. But the other two pieces of the puzzle, this is the only time in history which we have seen this. 
and obviously you know this energy security unfortunately because of the war in ukraine because of the recent energy crisis that we have seen in europe as uh, somehow energy security energy independence has become paramount for many countries so suddenly the importance of nuclear in this in this area is super super important and then the third piece which is the equity part that that you and i have discussed before is you know there is fine there, there is a global north that is trying to decarbonize but there is a global south that when we are talking an energy transition is going from no energy to energy this means enormous increase in demand if we want all those uh, all those people to actually reach the standard of living that you and I are enjoying today. So all those things together are bringing a lot of interest in nuclear. And as I said, is is policymakers, is the finance community, is the public in general. You see a lot of young people out there that are thinking, you know, uh, if we really want to do something about climate change, we need to bring nuclear into the equation. Salma, that was a great overview of the WNA and its various resources. Congratulations to you and your team for a very successful conference. Thank you very much, James, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And please, uh, you are welcome every year. Thank you. Hi, Pierre. Thank you very much for joining us today. WMC Energy is involved in the buying and selling of uranium for various clients. And why don't we just start right there? Who are your clients? Yeah, thanks. First of all, great to see you, Jimmy, actually in person. Most of the time we do it over the video, but now I actually get to meet you. That's great. Uh, yeah, WMC, we trade not only uranium, also the other components of the fuel cycle, so conversion, enrichment, bundle it together, and it's enriched uranium product, or EUP. So we certainly deal with that as well. Uh, primarily utilities are our clients, uh, but we don't have production facilities, so we obviously need to source it from somewhere as well. So we work with... Uh, yeah, producers in general, suppliers, other traders. Uh, our our team has grown quite a bit over the last uh, last year or two, so we can we have a pretty good span over the market. We cover pretty much everybody right now. So it's uh, I like some of the utilities I worked with a lot. For, I've done it for twenty years. I I tend to hang on to them anyway. But of course, most of my work is with Sprott. But uh, but my colleagues they they can cover the entire market right now. So we have a very good span. Anyway. So you mentioned you work or speak with a lot of utilities. Maybe get a, give me a sense of what they're saying in this current environment. And I'm sure you spoke to a lot of utilities during this week at the symposium. Yeah, we've spoken with quite a bit, and I've been I've been around in Europe now for almost two weeks. I've seen quite a few before as well. And uh, it's uh, the summer is normally quiet. Uh, utilities going to take the, either the summer off or it's just a quiet period in general. And then this kind of event, the symposium, sort of kicks off the the fall session, if you will. And uh, there's going to be quite a lot of tenders coming out. Uh, they, like we've been talking about this before, but the last couple of years or since the invasion, you've seen a lot of activity in conversion and enrichment. And that's obviously where the Russian supply is quite key. Now utilities are ready to move on to procuring uh, uranium itself, the U-308. And we are seeing, uh, yeah, it's going to be quite an active fall anyway. In the next couple of months, we're seeing four or five uh, tenders coming only out of Europe. Uh, this is not even counting North America or the rest of the world. So it's going to be it's going to be very busy. It's uh, exciting to see, and they're getting ready to uh, to start procuring material. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll be right in there with with everybody else and start and do some conversations with them and see what they want to do. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it'll, it'll be good, busy but good. And I'm curious when you speak to utilities. Is there a difference in terms of their procuring strategies if they're based in Europe versus those in North America? Normally not, uh, but I would say now there's more of a sense of urgency if you're in Europe because you are much closer to uh, closer to the Russia situation. Also, a lot of European utilities, or a fair number, a handful of them at least, they have Russian-designed reactors, and with those reactors, they've had sort of a lifetime supply of, uh, of Russian fuel bundles. Um, and that, of course, now they have moved away from that to your atom supply agency saying that you cannot be buying Russian fuel anymore. So they need to yeah, diversify and go somewhere else. And obviously that means that you have quite a bit of a lot near term demand, which you normally don't see. So that sort of when it spills over into the spot market. So it's a little bit of a different dynamic in Europe, for sure, and clearly a more sense of an urgency. But even, we have seen activity in the U.S. I'm sure we will see activity in the U.S., but the majority of it is in the next two months anyway, it's going to be in Europe. And so let's talk about the spot market. Give us some sense of what's happening there. What are you seeing and, 
maybe speak to the liquidity? Yeah, normally when uh, when you sort of the last conference in June, then you just uh, you go to sleep or you take vacation for a couple of months and nothing happens. Uh, this year has been different. Uh, early August, the uh, things started ticking up. Activity picked up. Uh, you saw a couple of utilities even were in there. Uh, producers were in there. Of course, the situation in Niger, even though we don't see any direct impact on the production there, but clearly a significant amount of material of Orana's production is based in Niger, and a lot of that goes to EDF. Now, they have plenty of inventory, so there's no concern there just yet, but of course... It's monitor- being monitored very closely, and I'm, I would be surprised if entities have not started picking up spot material just in case there is a disruption there. So that started already in August. Uh, and then, of course, this, earlier this week, there was an announcement from Cameco that some of the production capacity in Canada is going to be down. So sure, that's not all Cameco's portion. Uh, about half of it is, a little bit more, but that also affects the French again. And, uh, and a Japanese minority owner too. So clearly not just the utilities need to buy, now producers who were already short, now they're even shorter. Uh, and yeah, traders, opportunistic, of course. And knowing that there's going to be a lot of utility activity coming up, you want to make sure that you have those pounds. So there's been a, a fair bit of activity in the market just over the last few weeks. We normally would see being very quiet, and we've also seen the uranium price have ticked up, you know, quite a few, quite a little bit here. And we would expect it to be just flat. It's now up well about $60, which is uh, the highest it's been in quite a long time. And in terms of volume, like, would somebody be able to acquire 250,000 pounds or 500,000 pounds in the spawn market? Yeah, there was, uh, there was last week, there was, uh, there was rumors that there was uh, about half a million pounds uh, that someone needed. Uh, now, I think they managed to get it, but uh, the entity selling it might not have had all of it. They had a bit of it, not all of it. So it might have been caught short, and that led to some of the buying that we saw last Friday. So again, this is not, we weren't involved, but yeah, you mean know, a tight knit community, you talk to people, you can kind of start piecing things together. So it's uh, regardless of the exact events that happen it's a clear signal that it's extremely tight in the spot market anyway. It's uh, if you're going to go out, the, you, I don't, you cannot find a single entity that would sell you and have half a million pounds lying around that I'm quite certain of. 80% of all trading occurs in the term market. Why don't you give us a rundown on what you're hearing and seeing there? Uh, yeah, it's, it's obviously on, on track to be the busiest uh, term contracting year for uh, in over a decade. And, uh, and it's, it's still coming. Like I mentioned, there's four or five tenders coming only in the next couple of months. And that's only in, in certain parts of Europe. Uh, so there would be quite a lot to add to that, I think. Now, most of the time, the reported numbers, the reported ones, the contract is signed. And these, this is a process that can take six, maybe even nine months sometimes. So even if the number is not going to show up in the total this year, it will still show up next year in that case, because the, the activity is still going on. There's, uh, there's ongoing discussions in right now in London, probably a dozen of them right now, and, and they will keep going for the next few months for sure. Perry, you've been coming to the World Nuclear Symposium for many years now. Is there anything, does anything stand out about this one from previous years? Very, uh, very vividly, the size. <laughs> it's, uh, say, five years ago, it was maybe not even half. Like, you go into the, uh, the, the session uh, room over there, and it was not even half full. And uh, today on the opening session and right now in the closing ses- session, it's, it's standing room only. So I think it's close to 700 delegates, and that's, uh, yeah, it's as much as it's ever been. And I think it's a very simple indicator maybe, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It, everything is full speed ahead. It's, uh, it's a... It's a really good time for the industry. Pierre, as always, great insights. Thank you very much for making the time. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. David, thank you very much for joining us today. Denison Mines flagship asset is the Wheeler River Mining Project, and that's comprised of both Phoenix and Griffin. You recently came out with a feasibility study on the Phoenix project. And I want to spend some time on this. Maybe you can just take us through the highlights of that feasibility study. Yeah, Jimmy, it was a real important milestone for our company. Um, The updated technical report just came out for Wheeler River. uh, has two parts to it. Uh, A feasibility study for Phoenix as uh, an ISR uranium mine and an update to a PFS for the Griffin deposit as an underground mine. 
and, and you're right, highlight continues to be for our company, the results on Phoenix. Um, really an excellent outcome after several years of technical de-risking, proving up uh, what was uh, really a game-changing decision from us in 2018 to declare Phoenix as a future ISR mine. And now we've spent uh, the last four or five years de-risking, building our data, and proving up that the concept of ISR mining is no longer a theoretical application uh, to the Athabasca Basin, but is something that actually does work. Uh, we've now proved it in the field, and we've layered that into the feasibility study. Now, our feasibility study is done by an external qualified party uh, under our Canadian securities regulations. This international engineering firm, Wood, that was authoring this, working together with us to bring it to uh, the highest level of standard in our, in our regulatory framework. We confirmed that the project has uh, tremendous economic potential, and we confirmed all the key technical details um, were similar. Now, a lot of things changed uh, from 2018 to now uh, based on the work we've done, but the mining method continues to be robust. Uh, the technical sides working better, or at least as well as we thought it would. And even with all of the changes in costing and all of the design changes, the project remains positioned to be one of the lowest cost uranium mines in the world, competing with the likes of Kazatomprom and the Kazakh ISR operations, and even and, 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 and better than the large scale conventional mining operations that already exist in the Athabasca Basin. So. Uh, an enormous accomplishment for our team and really positioning our company now to move forward and become one of the next new producers in Canada. And when in production, the Phoenix will be the first ISR uranium mine in Canada. That's true. Um, we, we are leading the industry when it comes to ISR mining in Canada. ISR mining is a common uh, way to extract uranium globally, but it's not being used in Canada. And uh, we have been pioneering that, and we've developed an in-house team uh, that has really uh, and created an enormous competitive advantage for our company. And uh, maybe just a bit of a sidebar on that is that um, we're actually doing work on a joint venture with Arano uh, called the Midwest Project, where we have a minority position, but um, we're working together with Arano in a way where they've brought us on to evaluate Midwest uh, as an ISR mine. And that just recognizes that our team has expertise that does not exist elsewhere in the industry when it comes to testing and understanding how ISR mining will work in the high grade uranium deposits of the Athabasca Basin. And you bring up an interesting point there. Does Orano currently have any ISR operations? Globally, yes. You know, uh, Orano has interest in Kazakhstan that are ISR. Uh, and of course, Arano has all the capabilities in the world. This is a, a you know, one of our, our industry leaders, but um, it's unique what we're doing. And, and so they recognize that and realize that it's, it's not easily replicated to uh, acquire the knowledge and the experience that we have over the last few years in the field, in the lab, doing the technical studies to actually figure out uh, how ISR mining will work successfully in the Athabasca Basin. And now that you've completed the feasibility study on Phoenix, what are the next steps? Yeah, I mean, does it get a little bit boring? Maybe it gets a little bit boring. Um, we, we've already transitioned into engineering design, so front-end engineering design and into detailed design, that's next. Uh, and, and really that's executing on the, on the feasibility study at a level that we can turn into construction. Uh, so that, that work will continue for the next few years in parallel to our permitting efforts such that uh, when we have an improved envir approved uh, environmental impact statement uh, and we're sufficiently licensed that we can make a construction decision and execute on those engineering plans. So uh, that's, you know, call it a two year uh, timeline here from where we're at to be through permitting and all that detailed design with a view to start construction in 2025 and a view to have first production by 2027, 2028. That's a great overview of what's happening at Phoenix. Now let's move our, our attention toward Griffin. You came out with an updated pre-fees on Griffin. Take us through that. Yeah, a little less exciting. Um, what, what, what we've done at Griffin, we, we really focused there on updating for costs. 
We made minimal design changes, uh, a few little tweaks to uh, some of our scheduling, uh, but but no notable changes. It was really focused on cost updating. Now, I think that was really informative because costs went up. And um, in our industry, many of the companies that are operating do not have current technical reports. And it's, it's, it's sort of a guessing game uh, what the real cost of production will be or what the real cost of new uh, development assets will be. And so with, with Griffin, uh, while we were able to preserve the project as being highly economic and positioned in the bottom quartile of the cost curve still, um, our costs are up. And, and I think people can look at those costs and say, this is still one of the best mining projects in the world. But imagine those kind of cost increases on maybe of a higher scale or larger scale applied to a project that was already further up the cost curve. And then start to think about all of the analysis that everybody has done in our market year after year after year around cost curve and which is the incremental project necessary to balance this demand supply equation and realize that all those assumptions that people have said of price having to be in the $75 range or whatever they might have prognosticated, it's probably higher today. Uh, and, and there aren't a number of public studies out there recently that reflect current costs. And so Griffin was a very good outcome still in that our NPV uh, was within 5% of where we were in 2018. When you consider the kind of cost increases that we reflect in there, that's still a great outcome because we juggled some of our scheduling uh, differently, but apply those kind of costs or more to that marginal project that's already in the third quartile of the cost curve. And you'll see that that, that incremental project is much more expensive in reality today than what a lot of people are looking at when they look at a report or a study that was done five years ago or eight years ago. Very good point. And inflation is impacting mining operations throughout the world. And now that you've completed this feasibility study on Phoenix and the updated pre-fees on Griffin, you have a good understanding of how costs are in the basin. Maybe you can just speak to that, how inflation is impacting operations in the basin. Yeah, look, we saw inflation like everyone would expect across the board, materials, labor, um, we were very lucky in that our projects have very low cost profiles. So when you start with a lower base and you add to it uh, that inflation, you're, you're way better off than when you start with a very high base. Um, the nature of Phoenix really protected it from inflation because it has uh, the ISR mining just has uh, much lower capital costs up front. Uh, labor costs are, are much reduced because you're using pumps and valves and things like that instead of people operating equipment. And so we were really insulated from that. But, but I can tell you that there's, there's inflation across everything. And uh, again, the, the point is that projects that are out there that have not updated their costs, um, if they just proceed uh, without updating costs, there, there will be a, you know, an, a rude awakening perhaps for some of those projects when they try to deliver on those estimates. And, and certainly as people update their uh, studies we will see costs go up and they should see it across reagents, materials, labor uh, in the Athabasca Basin, but you'll, you'll see it everywhere. David, that's a go to overview of what's happening at Phoenix and Griffin. Now I want to move on. One of the interesting aspects of Denison Mines that I always find enjoyable is the fact that you purchased 2.5 million pounds of uranium in 2021, just under $30 a pound. Mm. It's now trading at approximately $60 a pound in the spot. What are your intentions with this uranium? Yeah, I mean, we, we did that as a long-term strategy. Uh, we weren't intending to trade. It was really about um, providing enormous stability to our balance sheet. You know, with, with Phoenix moving forward, um, we didn't want to be susceptible to the ups and downs of the capital market, knowing how much we'd have to invest in the project uh, and, and the commitment that it would be to move Phoenix through feasibility study and into detailed design and engineering. So the, the physical uranium was really about adding balance sheet strength, but having exposure to our commodity rather than just having cash. Now, it's obviously worked out well for us, and we played out all the scenarios of how it might not work out well to buy physical uranium, uh, but, but it, was a, it was a sensible choice, and it has gone one of the ways we thought it could go with the value increasing. What's tricky with it, Jimmy, is that um, we have options that are not normal for developers. 
Uh, most most developers that don't have a producing asset have a very clear path of what they need to do, and they have to go raise money to, to build their mine. We have a financial near financial asset in the uranium that we can use potentially multiple different ways. And the right use of that material changes based on the conditions in the market, potentially daily. So there are certain circumstances where the right thing to do would be to monetize some of the uranium instead of raising equity. There are certain circumstances where um, we're less sensitive to that and, and equity prices are favorable. Uh, and maybe we would hold the uranium as we've been doing to uh, leverage it for future project financing or, or initiatives related to that. It could be a collateral for a debt that changes the pricing on the debt. It could be used as um, a collateral or an assurance in an offtake agreement. It could be used as part of uh, a supply contract or any number of other things that changes conventional equations for developers. So we're in that process now of assessing, uh, now that the feasibility study for Phoenix is done, uh, how do we move forward with project finance and how do we best use the physical uranium? So we don't have an answer to that per se uh, right now in terms of what we're going to do with it, but we are being cautious and we do see it as an important asset on our balance sheet that de-risks our company generally. I mean, investors should be confident to know that if the market is down, we're not in a position where we must go and raise significant amounts of equity to continue the project. We have the physical uranium. Uh, and, and that uranium has obviously increased in value and continues to increase in value, where now we would have in the range of half of our upfront capex for Phoenix already on the balance sheet. This is a characteristic you will never see out of, out of developers. Uh, you know, pre-permitting, pre-construction decision or pre-project finance, we already have essentially half of our upfront capex on the balance sheet. So I do think that makes us unique in that investors can look at our story and, and realize that the potential equity dilution of our company is simply lower than many of our peers. David, as we head into year end, what further catalysts can we expect from Dennis and Mines? Well, Jimmy, we're working um, on exploration. Uh, I love our exploration strategy. Um, we are aggressively seeking ISR amenable deposits, and I think we're still an outlier in that. Um, number of the players in the region continue to be looking for basement hosted deposits. We want things that are in sandstone. And actually we think there's great opportunity because that was not generally a target for many years on many properties. So we do have active exploration, it could be a catalyst any day sort of thing. We are also working on our agreements with indigenous groups. Um, so we've taken an approach of having foundational agreements that we've already signed with multiple indigenous groups that cover all of our properties. Uh, rather than just Wheeler River and all of our activities pre-construction. Uh, but we are working on agreements for advancing Wheeler River to construction and into production. So those will be important de-risking uh, catalysts for us, any announcements of impact benefit type um, agreements. And we are working on Midwest with Arano, and there is the potential towards the end of the year or into next year to um, update the internal concept study that we completed for Arano uh, at the beginning of 23 and from work at the end of 22 on ISR mining at Midwest, there is the potential to publish a PEA uh, for ISR mining at Midwest. And, and that's something we're very excited about because we do think it, it could be very robust. David, you've been coming to the World Nuclear Symposium for many years now. Have you noticed any noticeable differences? Yeah, Jimmy, it's, uh, it's a unique event. Um, not every year is as topical to sort of the uranium supply side of things. But this year, it was one of the years where they were updating uh, their supply demand uh, model. So they do that periodically. So I sat in that session yesterday and I took a, a few notes. So I'm happy to share them with you. Um, look, it, it was, there was a notable change uh, in the way they were presenting the supply demand picture. Demand has certainly firmed up and they're now projecting more growth than they were in the last report. And the supply side of things, uh, I think the uh, committees that are involved in this report were really flagging that there are some concerns. So I'll go to my phone here. This is right from the floor, okay, Jimmy? Um, 
new projects need to be accelerated. Uh, we're running out of time. These are quotes uh, or paraphrasing from, from remarks made by the panel. We need more proactive collaboration between suppliers and customers. Uh, one of the contributors commented, we're on a path where not everybody will get the supply they need. And we've sort of been saying that for some time, realizing the time it takes to advance projects. Dennis in unique position in that we've advanced projects through difficult years because of our economics. Those marginal projects at the top of the cost curve, highest cost stuff, how could they invest when uranium price is $29? So those projects are, are behind. Um, the other one that I found was interesting for, from one of the utility contributors. Uh, things are tightening up. We have to start paying attention to form, location, and mobility. The report could be a bit of a wake-up call. So, uh, look, I think they're uh, presenting a picture that shows demand is very positive and that supply of the uranium is actually a, a, quite a legitimate concern. And sometimes um, this industry forgets that nuclear power comes from uranium. You know, of course, we all know that, but um, all the work we're doing uh, in this industry, building power plants and decarbonizing, it can't happen if we don't have the uranium to go into the reactors. And uh, I think that was really a powerful theme that came from that, from that update to the report. And it was a very well attended session. So I'm hopeful that that message starts to percolate throughout the rest of the conference. David, great insights as always. Thank you very much for providing an update on both Phoenix and Griffin. Jimmy, my pleasure, and, and thanks so much for being here uh, in the trenches on the floor uh, in action. It's great, great, great for you to be here. Thank you. Kirk, thank you very much for joining us today. According to the WNA, Urenco is the world's second largest enricher, comprising approximately 30% of uh, global market share. And I'm just curious how Urenco is responding to this changing nuclear energy environment. Well, enrichment services are a manufactured product, and so we're well prepared to expand to meet the expanded use of nuclear power. It's something that we've done before, and we are prepared to do it again. We are embarked on a project to increase our global staff by about 25% this year to help us manage what we expect will be significant growth. We've also made some new contracts with our uh, centrifuge supplier enrichment technology company in order to ensure critical supply chains. Uh, we just announced our first expansion uh, in the U.S., uh, a, a fairly modest uh, 700,000 SWU per year that will be uh, in place in early 2027. We're also looking at uh, the market's demand for advanced fuels. These are fuels with enrichments that are higher than 5% U-235. As a first stage to address this demand, we are about to submit a license amendment to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to relicense our entire U.S. facility to produce up to 10 weight percent U-235. We're also uh, deeply uh, involved in the design of what we call a high assay LEU module. This will be a site within our existing site that is dedicated to the production of up to 20% U-235. And we're working very closely with reactor vendors on uh, their demand for high assay LEU, as well as involved in the DOE, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's request for proposals for high assay LEU. And when you said that increased capacity in the U.S. is going to come on in 2027, I'm surprised it would take so long. Why is that? That's not actually that long in, in terms of nuclear build-out. Uh, we'll begin the uh, expansion in 2025 and uh, progress it all the way through the beginning of 2027. Uh, Urenco's technology is modular and expandable, so we don't need to uh, wait until we're finished installing new machinery. As we install it, we can start it in production. Uh, so it will ramp up in a linear fashion. All aspects of the fuel cycle have seen significant price increases in the past year. Maybe you can just speak to what you and your team are seeing at your Urenco from enrichment prices. Sure. Um, we're seeing a real renewed emphasis on the security of supply from our customers. 
Uh, the uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has really uh, shaken uh, the faith in uh, what, what uh, can be fairly characterized as the world's largest nuclear fuel supplier. And uh, there is a flight to uh, safety uh, in terms of contracting with what is seen as secure, sustainable partners for fuel supply. And in addition to the higher prices from enrichment services, what other aspects of the contracting, enrichment contracting, are you seeing? We're uh, particularly, uh, we're seeing in requests for proposal the words non-Russian, which means that the prices that are being reached in today's market are those that reflect sustainable Western supply. Um, so we're seeing uh, those level of prices as well as much longer delivery terms and contracts. Uh, we have uh, increased uh, our order book uh, from the end of 2021, just before the start of uh, the war in Ukraine, from a level of 8.7 billion euros to uh, at the end of the half year this year to 12 billion euros. And we have now commitments that extend through 2045. So it really highlights uh, the uh, renewed emphasis on security of long-term supply for our customers. In terms of pricing, we've seen significant moves in both conversion and enrichment here in the past year or two years. Not so much in the spot price, and many market pundits say that is because the fuel buyers are more focused on conversion and enrichment. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know. It's a good question for fuel buyers in particular. My observation is uh, along the lines of their focus on long-term security of supply. Uh, neither the conversion or enrichment market are particularly liquid. So the practice has always been on midterm or long-term supplies. Uranium market is much more fluid, and so there has been a reliance on spot purchases uh, in certain customers' portfolios. I think today uh, that uh, customers are looking for long-term sustainable partners in all components of the fuel cycle, including uranium. So they're not purchasing less uranium, but they're probably purchasing uranium under different uh, contract conditions. Are utilities in one region of the world more aggressive in acquiring enrichment services than other regions? Well, uh, it's a good question. I, I think all uh, nuclear companies are concerned about security of the supply, and increasingly the governments where they operate are also uh, concerned about security of supply. Um, I think there is some regional uh, uh, differences that we can observe. For instance, in those countries that operate Russian-designed VVER reactors also happen to be in countries that have been affected by disruptions in other kinds of Russian energy supplies. Uh, we can see that reflected in their procurement strategies, which is a rapid diversification away from what has been exclusively Rosatom supplies to those uh, utilities. In the United States, which is Urenko's largest market, uh, the imports of Russian fuel is already limited by the Russian suspension agreement. However, there is a lot of noise and discussion about potential legislation that would reduce those import limits even further. And that has had an impact on procurement practices in the United States and the pace of procurement. And Kirk, maybe you can just add a little bit more context as to what the limits are associated with that Russian suspension agreement? Sure, it's, a, it's an agreement between the governments of the United States and the governments of Russia based on an anti-dumping complaint that dates back uh, more than 40 years. Uh, the current version of this agreement limits uh, Russian imports to the U.S. by year. And uh, currently, I believe the limit in 2023 is 24% of the U.S. market but that declines to 15% in 2028, all the way through 2040. You are adding capacity in the U.S., but what will it take for Urenco to add further capacity across all of its facilities or increase capacity? It's a great question. Uh, Urenco is a, quite a conservative company. Uh, we're very much a nuclear company focused on safety and our reputation for 100% reliability of delivery. Um, in that vein, we don't install speculative capacity. We only install capacity to the extent it's necessary to serve long-term contract demand. So that's the first ingredient we're looking for. Long-term contracts that are sustainably priced will underpin investments in new capacity. 
The second thing we're looking for is some indication from governments that there will not be a future flood of Russian fuel supply into Western markets. As you know, uh, Russia itself is an inaccessible market to third parties. So it's a one-way flow of material from Russia to the West. And we have had the experience of stranding investments at a significant economic uh, hit uh, to, our, uh, to our bottom lines. And we want to avoid that situation in the future. Kirk, you have been coming to many symposiums over the years, and I'm just curious to hear your views on how this one is different just in terms of its tone toward nuclear energy. I think there's two words that sum it up. Abundant optimism. Uh, that is a sense that pervades, I think, every single delegate here. Uh, there is an enthusiasm for the renewed use of nuclear power around the world. There is an abundance of really, really bright people working on new nuclear technologies. And I think that has absolutely influenced the front end of the fuel cycle in terms of uranium exploration, uh, restart of conversion facilities, and of course, expansion of enrichment facilities. Well, Kirk, thank you very much for providing that overview of Urenco and its enrichment business. Once again, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Dustin, thank you very much for joining us today. Kazataprom is the world's largest uranium producer, producing approximately 25% of global production. And you recently released your operational results for the first half of 2023. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact that your sales numbers are going up, but production is remaining the same. Can you just expand on that and why that is? Oh, yeah. Thank you, James. Thank you for your question. This is mainly because uh, of upflex in the existing contracts and uh, new contracts that we have concluded throughout this year with delivery started in 2023. And when you refer to upflexing, you're talking about the fact that buyers are exercising a right to acquire more uranium? Yes, under the existing contracts, uh, there, is this, there is this mechanism called upflex, which we allow our buyers to purchase some certain amount of material, like uh, on top of already agreed quantities. And so if production is remaining the same, does that mean the additional pounds will come from your inventory? Yes, exactly. Typically speaking, how many months or years worth of inventory would Kazataprom keep on hand? Typically six to seven months of attributable production is in stock. That has been our corporate uh, policy. And in terms of guidance for 2023, it remains the same. What about 2024 and 2025? So 2024 is minus 10 of our subsoil use contracts, roughly around 65 million pounds. And as for 2025, the decision is going to be taken later this month. And this is just going to be based on two market fundamentals, such as supply and demand in our contract book. And we'll announce it in a due course. And Dustin, maybe you can give us some color as to what you're seeing or hearing within the contracting market. Well, uh, Given the current uh, set of geopolitical events, uh, everyone is uh, really interested in uh, securing supply, in ensuring that they're going to receive their material on time. And long-term contracting is actually on the rise, I'd say. And well, security of supply is becoming a priority. Let's just put it this way. So everyone is actually approaching and talking to us with regards on how they can do some business. In the past, Kazataprom has entered into deals with CNNC, which is one of the largest utilities within China. And I'm curious, as we go into year end, can we expect further press releases with CNNC or any other utility? I wouldn't be surprised if these things happen under Kazakhstani legislation, whereas uh, we need to publish and make certain things public uh, when the, the magnitude of the deals uh, exceed certain thresholds. So that, was been, that has been the case with the announcements we already made. So let's move on now and discuss transportation. Uh, a lot of the uranium that comes from Kazakhstan is transported through the port of St. Petersburg. Have there been any issues? Are you still able to transport as much uranium as you want through St. Petersburg? Yeah, actually, there are no problems associated with transportation through Russia. It's just a matter of preference uh, given to us by our clients. 
whereas they prefer to transport it via St. Petersburg or via Transcaspian International Transport Group. And you mentioned Transcaspian route. What about, how is that going? Are you still transporting pounds through there? Have there been any challenges? Yeah, we are transporting a lot through Transcaspian route. Uh, there are no challenges. Perhaps certain implications associated with infrastructural uh, limitations, but that's just it. All deliveries that are expected through this route are going to be completed uh, in accordance with the agreement. Another element that stood out to me in your operational results was inflation, and this is something that's impacting mining companies throughout the world. Maybe you can just speak to that. Oh yeah, like just as you can imagine, uh, we are no exception to the ongoing situation in the world where inflation has hit everyone hard and it had a slight uh, impact on our cash costs. But also it's mostly related to our uh, new mineral extraction tax that has been put in place. And now the, it's based not on the production, the cost of production, but rather on the, on the spot price. So it also had a certain impact. But in general, I mean, inflation is a global issue and we're doing everything we can to tackle that. Another issue that's impacted mining companies globally is supply chain issues. And what about Kazatoprom? Are you having any issues securing critical materials such as sulfuric acid? Luckily, we've been able to surpass and overcome all the difficulties and obstacles we have encountered and faced in the past years. And that is also due to a stress test that we had during the COVID era in 2020 and 2021, where the ch supply chain all across the world was uh, put under the strain, was placed under the strain. And it also gave us uh, invaluable experience on how to deal with these issues. So as it stands, uh, we don't have any major limitations nor difficulties associated with supply of production materials. I want to move the discussion now toward corporate strategy. In the past, your strategy was one of value over volume. Is this still the case? That is exactly still the case here. We try to concentrate on maximizing profitability and value and benefits for our shareholders. But then again, given the current market situation, uh, we're reviewing all our opportunities and like re re redesigning and rethinking our strategy and tactics on how to approach and deal with the ongoing market situations. Well, Dustin, that was a great overview of Kazataprom, and thank you very much for the update. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure. Wish you good luck in everything you do. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. UXC offers many services to the nuclear energy and also the uranium sectors, yeah. and the most important of which is price forecasting and analysis, and this is where I want to focus our discussion on today. And when you speak with the various constituents within the spot market, what are you hearing in terms of liquidity? How many pounds would be available? Yeah, good question. I mean, it's definitely a, a, a much tighter market than I've seen in a long time. Uh, you know, let's say three, four years ago, it was flush with material, and we've had what I call three big shocks of COVID, sput and Russia, and combining the effects of all those, it's really taken a lot of material off the market very quickly, and it has uh, also increased the demand. Uh, so right now we're looking at a spot market where if you have one week of a million pounds traded, the price moves. You don't get a situation where somebody could just come to the market and not affect price if, you know, 100,000, 200,000 pounds might not move the market very much. But yeah, as I say, a million pounds or more a week, that, that starts to see the, uh, the price effects pretty quickly. So if somebody was trying to acquire a half a million or a million pounds, how high would they have to go? How high would the price go to get that in? Look, I mean, that's a, hard to say for sure. But, you know, just using the last couple of weeks as an example, we saw a couple of weeks of a million pounds or so traded, not all in one lot. You know, you have multiple trades, but prices have moved, you know, two, three dollars in that in that week, in a couple of weeks. So it definitely would move the market. I don't, you know, if somebody tried right now to get 500,000 pounds in a very short period of time. It's possible you could see the price move a couple of dollars at least. 
And when it comes to the sellers, I'm curious who they are. Are they producers? Are they traders? Who exactly are they? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a mixed bag of, of available pounds at any given time. So uh, I would say producers are much less part of the equation when it comes to spot supply. Uh, so you're talking mostly material that uh, a trader has um, not necessarily on the books, but, you know, maybe has figured out the way to access. And uh, so, you know, indirectly, maybe there are some producer pounds like offtake agreements and so on that are entering the market, but not directly by tra uh, producers, but rather traders selling those. Um, you know, you've got little pockets of other material inventories and the like, but uh, yeah, as I said, it's you, you, you're starting to get to a point where supply is, is, is hard to find. And so that's a good overview of what's happening in the spot market. What about the term market? What are you seeing or hearing there? Sure. I mean, the term market, it, it, it really picked up already last year, and it's been a continuation this year where we've had, um, you know, regular interest by utilities around the country, around the world. I mean, you've got, um, you know, buying by, uh, you know, there's been some well-publicized deals by China purchasing, but of course, um, you know, Ukraine kind of deal that Cameco announced, you know, pretty big contract with. Uh, so Europe is a big market still active. And then North America, certainly, you know, uh, can't discount at all what's going on there. I'd say last year was he heavier on the U.S. side than it has been so far this year. Uh, so more international outside of the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, contracting this year. Um, but maybe that's also uh, a sign that there's uh, more to come on the U.S. market this year still. And right now in the term market, how many buyers are there? How big are the orders? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's regular uh, activity. Some of it isn't public. You know, you do have public, uh, we call RFPs, where a utility comes out and, and says anybody, you know, that can't, wants to, can respond. Um, you know, not all of these are for pure U308, but they can be, you know, bundled products like UF6 or EUP, enriched uranium. Uh, so, you know, at any given time, there's two or three maybe utility requests that we're aware of that are sort of more public. But then beneath the surface, you have uh, a lot more sort of bilateral discussions happening between producers, suppliers, and utilities that are ongoing. So, you know, they may be something that uh, happens quickly. You know, a utility goes directly to a producer and says, hey, what can you show me for the next five years or, you know, starting three years out for five years? And, and they get something done pretty quickly, but sometimes these take a while to sort of materialize. And when you look at the spa market and the term market together, what, what's your sense, see, in terms of the tones? Do you feel like there's a sense of panic going on with fuel buyers? Uh, not, not really. I'd say utilities are still, they're, they're definitely, their anxiety levels have heightened, not just because of, I mean, it's a combination, of course, as I said, we've had some shocks. Some of those have affected their concerns over future supply. So security of supply now is paramount. You don't want to be signing up for product that you might not get. Uh, so there's definitely that risk profile has changed in their view. Uh, but price remains obviously of, of concern. They, 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 they don't want to be paying above market. Um, so, I mean, look, panic is not the way I'd put it. Uh, in the nuclear industry, you know, it's a conservative industry where folks run nuclear plants and the last thing you want is panic in a nuclear plant, uh, same goes in the fuel side too. So, uh, but that being said, I mean, there's a lot more interest right now by utilities to lock things up further out in time than I've seen in, you know, uh, in, in, in many years. So from that standpoint, the buying, d the desire to buy and make sure I have product and fuel for my reactors down the road, that has increased substantially. And I'm wondering about the recent news with Niger and also with Cameco reducing production at MacArthur. Have these events uh, created any more interest within either the spot or the term market, or is it still too soon? 
Yeah, I mean, look, there's always um, some events that, that change the psychology first, and then you see action. So Niger, you know, we haven't seen actual disruptions of deliveries yet. That being said, the potential um, seems to continue to be there. Uh, that story has, is far from being um, over. Uh, the news out of uh, Cameco and, the, and, you know, over the weekend, that's so fresh that uh, so far we haven't seen a big impact. We did see a little bit of an uptick in the spot price um, early this week as a result probably of the heightened uh, concern over supply for this year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely has been affecting uh, the mentality in the market and we're seeing more buying maybe as, as, uh, not more a little bit of buying maybe because they ex there's expectation that these events and the, the production issues we're seeing are going to increase the uh you know the lack of supply but um it's it's so far i haven't seen the price move dramatically as as a result of any of these announcements or events so that's a good overview of the spot market and the term market what about conversion and enrichment you also offer forecasting services here. Tell us, why don't we start with conversion? Yeah, conversion is uh, perhaps the tightest market of all at this point. So, you know, uranium, certainly uh, we just talked about is tight, but I would look at conversion as the tightest of all three of the, the front end component markets. Uh, you know, we had years of lack of uh, production or uh, per under production in conversion. You know, we just this year in July saw the big plant in the U.S. Uh, Metropolis plant restart. Uh, we're st still seeing the uh, the new plant in France has is still on its ramp up from uh, you know beginning of operations only just a few years ago. Cameco certainly is, is doing what they have to do, but uh, with the loss of supply out of Russia, which Russia doesn't necessarily sell conversion directly, they sell it as a, as a bundled product typically with enriched uranium. Uh, so that supply obviously has become much more risky and, and, and is going to be, it, it hasn't dropped off that much yet, but it will. Uh, but the big effect from Russia is that we've had a shift in uh, underfeeding by enrichers. And so when you take away that underfeeding, you do two things. You reduce the supply of UF6, but you also increase the demand for UF6. So it's a double whammy basically. So from that standpoint, um, conversion has gotten really tight. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I didn't mention this, but across the board, all the, the component markets, uh, the contracts uh, that have what we call flexibilities in them, so the ability to go up or down 10, 15, 20% on the supply, utilities are calling in those flexes and really maxing those out, so up flexing. And that's increased demand, uh, you know, across the board, uranium conversion and enrichment. So all of that adding up to a conversion market where we're at plus 40, $41 now in the, in the spot for KGU, which you got to realize we were at $4.50 back in 2017. So that's the spawn market. What about the term market? Where's the trading? The term conversion market is right around $30, so not that far off the spot. Um, but the spot is really tight, whereas... Uh, term is based more on production uh, out in time and yeah 30 similarly is more than double where it was just a few years ago and what about the enrichment market sure yeah uh, so enrichment great story there I mean you've got obviously as I just talked about the impacts from taking enriched uranium SWU out of uh, from Russia out of the market uh, and at the same time, the only thing that the, uh, the two other big enrichers, Urenco and Orono, can do in the short term is shift the way they operate their plants. So, um, uh, you know, increase their, their operating tails, which means they can supply a little bit more SWOO, so the enrichment side, but again, has the effect of increasing demand for the feed, the UF6. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, price jumped dramatically uh, around April of last year, um, you know, from... Uh, I can't remember exactly. We we're on fifty sixty dollars, and now we're you know we've moved well north of one hundred and forty uh, at the moment. So uh, getting close to one hundred and fifty. Uh, so yeah, it's a very uh, tight market, spot and term. Um, you have uh, you know some reactions so far from enrichers. We've seen Urenco announce they're going to add a little bit of uh, SWU at their U.S. plant uh, in New Mexico. But that's not going to come online until 25 at the earliest. 
So in the near term, um, you know, enrichers are only able to give so much uh, supply and the prices are just uh, not, yeah. I mean, prices are now up to a level where they're incentive to s produce more. But at the same time, um, you know, you, you could see some more room for upward moves on, on the swoop price too. Jonathan, in the past year, many market pundits have said that the spot price was not moving the way a lot of people thought it would with the positive narrative behind nuclear energy because utilities were focused on conversion and enrichment. Do you think that's still the case or are they starting to shift their interest more to acquiring uranium? Yeah, look, I mean, it is true that especially after the invasion of Ukraine, the first order of concern was the enrichment because that's really what Russia supplied in the Western market the most. Uh, and so, yeah, it was natural that enrichment and follow on to that conversion because of the feed needs were of higher priority, let's put it that way. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, uranium has never been a zero interest kind of situation. As I mentioned last year, we already saw a big uptick in, in uranium contract. That being said, I do think this year has been the year more of uranium for utilities than I've seen in a long time. Um, and, you know, that, that is leading to a lot more buying behavior by the utilities. But, you know, does that directly impact spot price all the time? Not necessarily, but, you know, so certainly we've seen an upward move this year in, in spot, right? We started the year um, sub 50 and now we're plus 60. And so, you know, not a bad move up if you consider, you know, where we were starting at. And I'd say there's still room, upward room, you know, uh, as a result of the activity that both utilities are doing. But again, it's not just utilities that buy uranium. So, you know, you do have producers, uh, traders, financials, you know, all of the above are active in that spot market especially. So it is clear that the demand for spot uranium um, and then as a follow-on for forward delivery, mid-term, long-term, that, that is not letting up in any way from what, what I'm seeing. Jonathan, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Last year, there was 125 million pounds contracted. Where do you think we go this year in 2023? Well, I can tell you it'll be higher than last year, um, mainly because I already know that around 120, give or take, maybe even close to 125, have already been contracted so far through the end of August. So from that standpoint, knowing that the uh, fall season tends to be pretty active in terms of uh, term contracting, I'm not going to be able to say for sure how high it'll go, 150, give or take, maybe something in that range. Uh, 200 million? I don't think we get to 200 uh, this year, but, you know, never say never. Could, could happen still. Jonathan, you've been involved in this industry for many years. Have you ever seen another time when it's been this bullish? for both nuclear energy and also the uranium. Yeah, so I was just quoted recently as saying, uh, you know, this is the best setup I've seen uh, for nuclear in, in my career. And I, I do think that uh, that still holds. Uh, so I, I was around in the last bull cycle with, uh, you know, prices going pretty sky high in 2006 and seven. Uh, we're not even there yet, I think. So um, yeah, uh, it's a very bullish outlook. Uh, obviously, nuclear power is, is the, the reason all of this exists. So we want to see a lot more positivity on new reactors, you know, extending life of reactors. The demand story is, is really good. That'll obviously lead to more positivity on, on the uranium side and, and likely upward moves in, in price. Jonathan, thank you very much for spending time with us today and providing your insights on the uranium pricing. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Lee, thank you for joining us today. You and your team have been very busy in the last few months. There's been a lot of positive news coming out on the Rook One project. And the first thing I want to touch on is the approval of the environmental impact study. Maybe you can just touch on that and tell us why that was important and it had a very positive impact on your stock price also. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, Mid-August, so about three weeks ago, we received a confirmation from the Ministry of Environment in Saskatchewan that our environmental impact study had passed their technical review. 
And the procedure is we're currently in the 30 day public comment period, which will conclude on October the 2nd. So uh, a little over three weeks from now. And, and after that, the uh, province will be in a position to provide ministerial approval of our provincial EIS. The next stage uh, will be the subsequent federal approval of the federal EIS. And the two documents are identical to one another. And uh, it, uh, it's an incredibly exciting time at the company. As you can imagine, going through a, an EIS is a very rigorous um, process, which commenced back in 2016 for Next Gen Energy. So we're very, very, it's always an exciting time at Next Gen, but um, it's, it's an incredible reflection on the entire team and, and their dedication and commitment to this uh, wonderful project. And our, our key goal is to make this the most environmentally well-managed mine uh, on the planet. And uh, we're certainly on that path as we speak. Post-approval, uh, in order to, you know, to be able to start the construction of, of this wonderful project, um, we're ready. We've got the engineering all, all ready for the early parts of the construction process. We've got the team in place. Uh, and uh, we're, we're very excited. It's, uh, it's a wonderful time at the company. And Lee, what's the timeline associated with the final approval from both the federal government and the provincial government? Yeah, so that, that's to be determined. Um, however, on a federal basis, uh, once the provincial environmental impact study is approved, and it's exactly the same document, um, uh, you would expect the federal process to occur shortly thereafter. We have 100% uh, community support from the local project area in the form of impact benefit agreements which have been um, signed. And so from a federal perspective, we have the EIS approved provincially and 100% uh, community support. It's set up for the, the federal government to complete their process. Um, the, the construction of the, uh, of the project um, is already underway. Uh, we've cleared the uh, production and exhaust shaft pads. We're currently expanding the accommodation camp to house the construction crew and uh, some minor surface infrastructure um, items. So uh, it's all ready. We're ready. And Lee, the other piece of significant news that was just released was that you raised $110 million through a debenture offering. Maybe you can just touch on who participated in that deal and what the use of proceeds will be. Yeah, sure. Look, uh, fantastic financing and, and it uh, is mainly from uh, Queens Road Capital, a uh, long-term shareholder uh, dating back to 2016, uh, Warren Gilman, Queens Road Capital's um, uh, CEO, $70 million. Um, we, it's a significant expansion of their investment in the company. And alongside of Queens Road Capital was uh, Sol Patterson's, a, a very um, um, a large institutional fund in Australia with, with a very long track record. And for those in North America who may not be as familiar, uh, over the last 20 years, they've had better returns than uh, Berkshire Hathaway. So a very well-respected, well-regarded uh, financial institution in, in Australia. And uh, we're very, very proud to have them on board as uh, uh, new members of the team. And that's interesting that you found this new shareholder in Australia. Are they invested in other uranium names or is this the first one? Uh, they're invested in Qu Queens Road Capital as well, whose biggest exposure is through Next Gen Energy. Uh, they, I think the timing of their entry into our project is, is coincident with uh, our stage of development. Um, they see uh, not only the market tightening um, and, and the uh, future of uranium prices likely to be uh, a lot higher, but also with us about to go through permitting, um, subject to government uh, approval, uh, and then getting into construction in a commodity upcycle is really a, a nice entry point to them. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're very proud to have them on board. It, uh, I think it speaks volume of, of next gen, not only the asset, but also the team that is in place and dedicated to uh, delivering this world-class project. And do you find there's more interest coming out of Australia as opposed to North America? The interest in North America and, and worldwide is very high. Um, is it increasing 
from Australia? Yes, it is. Uh, and and uh, look, they're very familiar with resources, projects. They've got a, uh, a large investor base that was focused on resource investing. And uh, just by volume of the meetings that we've had over the last three, ma- three months uh, coming out of Australia, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly um, uh, a time that uh, Australian investors are, are interested in nuclear energy. And look, having come from Australia, as everyone uh, is aware, um, I've never seen the sentiment towards nuclear energy as strong as it is down in Australia. And I think that's a realisation that the investments in wind and solar um, uh, uh, over the last 10 years isn't keeping up with the um, power demand. And so what you see is household um, power bills are actually increasing rapidly in, in Australia. And uh, uh, this appreciation for nuclear, I think, is, effect, uh, is really reflecting this, the, the general person out there's understanding of the science of nuclear, the provision of energy and clean um, over some of the false ideologies of the past. So. Uh, I think that's really pleasing to see, um, and, uh, it, and it's the right call, frankly, in terms of the energy transition. It has to embrace nuclear and wind and solar, but uh, I think Australia's reliance on wind and solar being the primary driver of, of energy pr- provision, uh, the provision of energy is um, now starting to be realised they need uh, another source. Lee, you and your team have been on the road marketing in Paris and now London, and you've met with many investors. And I want to get some color on what type of investors they were. Are they long only funds, hedge funds, or ESG funds? Yeah, it's a it's a combination of all those funds. Uh, really, the the it's a real energy thematic at the moment. Uh, I think funds are recognizing uh, the energy situation globally, and and that's just the basic provision of energy and to have it. Um, uh, decarbonated and what we are hearing very loudly is that uh, the security of supply for mined uranium is uh, uh, heavily dominated by um, countries that have very high uh, risk associated with them such as Russia and Russian controlled um, countries we've seen Niger last month uh, undertake or well, undergo a coup Niger represents about six percent of world's production, but it's about 25% of Europe's um, uh, fuel uh, source. And then when you consider another significant uh, 30-odd percent uh, of Europe's nuclear fuel is coming from Russia or um, Russian-influenced countries, there's actually a very high level of um, risk around the current fuel supplies for for the provision of nuclear energy. And so a lot of funds are recognizing that and they're looking at the, the fundamentals for uranium in terms of Western world production and its current cost. And they see that the spot price is still really not high enough to maintain existing production, um, let alone bring on or incentivize additional production. And, and at the end of this decade, the world is gonna have about a 90 million pound deficit between consumption and mine supply. And so the world, yeah, Next Gen's Arrow project, Roof One project, has the ability to produce 30 million pounds per annum. The world needs three, at least three Arrow sized projects in production by 2030, and they just don't exist. So, for all those uranium development companies out there who have been in the sector over the last 10 years and working hard, um, I'm really pleased to see that the market is moving in that direction uh, that is going to incentivize a diversified supply of Western world mine supply. So, um, yeah, all that hard work is is about to be realised and in, uh, in a market that uh, is going to be heavily reliant on Western world sources of, of production. Lee, I want to get your opinion now on strategic investments. This is something we've seen in the battery metal space. We've seen OEMs come and invest in producers and Explorco's. We've seen other producers also invest in Explorco's. Just recently, Albemarle, which is one of the world's largest lithium producers, made a $100 million investment in uh, an Explorco in northern Quebec. We haven't seen that yet in the uranium sector. Why? 
Yeah, look, I think it's in the earlier stage, like lithium's a little more advanced in terms of the market developing than uh, what uranium has. But the, the upside for uranium is, is very real and, and we're in the early innings of, a, uh, of it. Um, looking back at history, uh, in previous uranium up cycles, uh, you saw a lot of oil companies in the US owning uranium projects. And it's a fuel, it's an energy fuel, oil or uranium. And I think that's where you're going to see it head in the uranium space in the future, uh, particularly around you know, carbon tax on, on the production of oil. Well, nuclear energy is, is carbon free. So I think in one way or the other, you're going to see uh, energy companies that may, like oil companies, um, really look um, into nuclear energy and, and uranium mining as um, worthwhile business investments. And just like any other company, oil companies want a high ESG profile. And that's what uranium uh, mining will do for those oil companies. Um, you're also hearing the major miners, BHP, Rio Tinto, talk about transitioning to clean energy metals. Um, that's uranium. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's uh, in the early stages of that market evolving. But uh, it's certainly upon us, and um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And if history has taught us anything, I think you will see oil companies owning uh, uranium mines in, in the future. Well, Lee, that was a great update on NextGen, and thank you very much for making the time. Thank you, James. Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. You've been coming to the World Nuclear Symposium since 2017. And during that time period, the price of uranium has gone from six to $20 a pound to $60 a pound. And I'm just curious, what other changes have you seen over that time period? Yeah, it's a good question, Jimmy. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. What was permeating the room was there will always be uranium to buy and prices will continue to go down. And as an investor showing up, we were laughed at pretty much. Uh, for wanting to get involved in the sector. Fast forward to today, prices have tripled. We think they have a lot more room to run. Uh, the, I don't, I'm not an attendance keeper, but by a look of the conference, there's more, a lot more people. Uh, we are not laughed out of the room for our view. Uh, and in talking with people who make the stuff, sell the stuff, buy the stuff, uh, convert the stuff and uh, that are involved in it, there seems to be a view that they understand that that uh, demand will outstrip supply, and that means rising prices. So it's, it's done a 180. Mike, you and your team are heavily invested in uranium equities, but you're also investing in physical uranium, and I'm just wondering why. Why not just buy the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust product? Uh, good question, Jimmy. Yeah, so we do. We, uh, we invest a lot in the equities. We also own a uranium project. Uh, we are a large shareholder of the Sprott Physical Trust, but then we go a layer deeper where we actually buy physical uranium ourselves. Uh, and that, that gives us a different view into the market because it's an over-the-counter market. So there's not electronic trading. You're not seeing a bid and ask. Um, it's good old-fashioned phone calls, emails. Hey, I've got so such and such, such for sale, this many pounds. Uh, and so you're really getting, when there's pounds for sale, I'll know it. When there's not a lot of pounds and I want to buy it, I know it. And it gives me a sense for the depth and breadth of the market, which is a very interesting view to have. Uh, and, and oftentimes the equities move based on where the physical is going, right? So uh, I like to have that. And I, I also think um, it's, it's, uh, that it's, it's great value. So, you know, yeah, we're happy to own it spread it out a little bit between the equities. The equities are the bulk of it, but we, we also have uh, a lot of SROT and, 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 and physical. So yeah, it's, we do it to get a look at the market. Mike, the WNA has reported that there are 436 nuclear reactors operating globally. There's another 60 being built with 26 of those coming online in the next three years. And depending on the size of the reactor, it could use anywhere from 500,000 to a million pounds. You need another two to three million pounds or another two to three years worth of inventory. Is there enough uranium out there to not only supply the existing reactors, but the ones that are coming online in the next few years? 
It's a good question, Jimmy. So there, you know, uranium, there's uranium around. There's projects can, that can be developed. It all comes down to it's not how much, it's at what price does how much come, right? So it, you, one of the things when there's oversupply, like there had been for many years, the, the lowest cost producers were able to handle a lot of what was in the market because there was a lot of above ground secondary supply. You're, but you're at a point now where demand far outstrips supply. So to bring on the new supply that's needed, prices need to rise as you go through the, the, the cost curve. You're moving up the cost curve. So prices need to balance that market, need to, need to move higher uh, to incentivize that production. So it's there, it's, there are known resources in the ground. Now you gotta convince people that they should pull it out of the ground. And the way you do that, if you're a utility, is you pay uh, higher prices and lock in long-term contracts. And that's what we've been starting to see occur. So in 2022, there was 125 million pounds contracted. We're already at that point in September of 2023. Where do you think we finish up the year? Is it going to be 150 million pounds, 200 right, million pounds? I'd be pounds? surprised if it's not at least 150. Uh, you, you, you think about it as a rate of consumption. So if you go back from 1993 to 04, there was a period of down prices, right? It was a excess uranium in the market. You were just coming off of of Chernobyl in the, in the mid 80s and they had a lot of excess supply. And uh, the, the utilities would repurchase about one third of every pound that they consumed in a year. And they did that for the early 90s until the mid 2000s. And then they needed, to, they drew down the inventories. Then they needed to restock. And when they did that, they were buying 110 to 130% of their annual consumption and prices spiked a great deal. After Fukushima in 2011 through 2021, utilities were only replacing about 36, 37% of annual consumption. So what does that mean? They were drawing down inventories. Now they got to restock. And so, you know, when you look at the available primary supply and the secondary supply that exists, you're going to need higher prices for new production. And that's kind of where we're at now. And that's what the marketing's wrestling with in contracting. As they start to contract to consumption, they're running through those lower cost pounds. And that's where you start to see prices rise. I suspect you'll see uh, heavier contracting occur. Utilities, what I can see, the changes in speaking with them over the years, being at conferences like this, is there's awareness. There's a willingness for them to say, we get it. We're not gonna pay crazy prices. Personally, they may, <laughs> they may not, but it's not unreasonable to think that they could. If, but if they contract soon enough to, to get their consumption, they'll pay much higher prices, but they don't have to be crazy prices. It all depends on what they do. But it, in my mind, there's a clear momentum behind a contracting cycle well underway right now. So bottom line is prices are going a lot higher. Anything can happen, you never say, you know, with conviction. I mean, we're, we have a lot of capital that is, doesn't have to be there, but we're making the bet that it will based on supply demand fund like this. Um, and again, you know, we're always looking for reasons why that's not going to occur. But uh, we feel as though the dynamics are such where there's a lot more demand than supply. And you speak to many different investors in North America and Europe. What's your sense, if, if we were to use a baseball analogy, what inning are we in in terms of this trade? Uh, you know, it's, it's because of what we do, we're, we're a uranium fund, right? So we're in it day to day. So my head is oftentimes there. So I have to be very careful not to be myopic and I have to come back up, right? When you're in it day to day, uh, it can get tiring, it can get exhausting, it can be euphoric, right? So because you're up and, up and down, but we always keep our eye on the ball. And the ball is supply demand fundamentals. Um, so where, you know, the price of uranium, uh, the, where's contracting? Contracting, you're in the early innings of a cycle. I, that's where I think you are. Price is a difficult call from there. Where are we, because that's price of the equities, that's going to depend on how big the market caps of these companies grow and how many institutional investors that can attract. We've seen a significant more amount of interest. I mean, I say we, the, by the market cap rise in the industry, I actually, we don't speak to a lot of investors. We're not, 
that interested in spending our time doing that because um, we buy for our own stuff. We're not trying to educate them. Um, but just people who will call us, want to learn about what's going on. Yeah, it's there. What inning is the, is the price of uranium? You know, that the market will determine that. I, we just think it's got to go higher. Uh, I, you, you know, we, we, we're not into predicting crazy numbers for, for uranium. It doesn't need to get there. Yeah, what I can say is this. In the last cycle, the price of uranium needed to get to 60, 65 bucks. And if you were to look at the consensus expectations before a, a what is considered to be a reason for the last bull market, the Cigar Lake flood in October of 06. And for those who don't know what that means, Cigar Lake was a mine coming online in 07, bringing 18 million pounds a year. And it was the largest mine and highest grade mine that was starting in the next year. That in 07, that flooded in October of 06. And by December, January, it was obvious it wouldn't come on for years. People today would credit that as the kickoff of the bull market last cycle. That's actually incorrect. The price of uranium was seven bucks in 2000. By the time that flood occurred, it was well into the 40s. It had moved almost seven X. That's a bull market. If you looked at the forecasts the month before the flood, and you said, okay, how long do they contract for? Six, seven years? That's typical contracting period. The market was in surplus of 125 million pounds. If you looked at the price forecasters, uh, or the, the forecasters modeling, and Wall Street copies that. If, and prices went crazy when the, when the flood came, even though there was a surplus in the market. Now let's fast forward to today. The price needs to get $85, $90 to balance the market. If I were to look at even the price forecasters forecast through 2030, they show something like, uh, they may have ch changed it recently, a uh, small change. Let's say 95 million to 100 million pounds, 90 million pounds of a deficit through 2030. We're, our math is much higher than that from a deficit standpoint. So in the last cycle, you needed to get into the 60s with a surplus showing, a flood comes, Three months after that flood came, the new forecasts not only showed 125 million pounds of surplus, they showed another 100. So they showed 225 million pounds. So somewhere between the time that flood occurred and the new forecast came out, they found new pounds that would come out of mines. Demand came down a little bit, but there was still a surplus. That doesn't exist today. There's no magic math that shows that there are surpluses. There are de structural deficits. And when we talk deficit, Jimmy, I'm not saying in the spot market today, you can't find a pound. I'm talking when consumption equals contracting. The, not a third of consumption, not two thirds. How much economical pounds exist to sell? That's where prices go higher. And because fuel buyers are not financially incentivized to call bottoms. They are, finan they are incentivized to secure uranium. If it's $20 or $100, $150, they need the uranium. It's a small portion of the overall price to operate a plant. They will pay what they need to pay to feel that they have security. We're starting, we're, so where are we on that? You're still, I, my view is still early to not even middle innings yet. Well, Mike, I always enjoy speaking with you. You're always very frank, and thank you very much for sharing it your insights. It doesn't make me popular with people buying uranium on the on the utility side, but I'm okay with that. I, I just share what our view is, and I've been saying that since uranium was 20 bucks, and here we are. So we'll see where it goes. I, you know, we'll see where that falls. Uh, I mean, we'll see where the chips fall. I, I think prices go up, but uh, we'll see where we go. Once again, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks.